In this lecture, uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, French Wars of Religion, something that uh, you've already read a bit about in your textbook. But um, we're going to get started uh, in this lecture with a quick review of John Calvin in the Calvinist theology. Um, Calvin, like Luther, believed that all humans were sinful by nature and that the only way uh, a human being could uh, attain salvation in the next life would be through God's election of souls. So Calvin believes in this uh, theory uh, that we call predestination, and uh, that that is God chooses uh, who to save, but also chooses who to damn. Um, Calvin also went farther than Luther, and he preached that the use of symbols uh, or idols in church, uh, whether it be artwork, stained glass windows, paintings, statues, uh, adornments on the altars, uh, crucifixes hanging from the walls, uh, was uh, really not to be tolerated because they would then be distractions um, and that a, a person really had to uh, sit in church and hear the word of the preacher. So for Calvin, and other reformers, it's really the word delivered by the preachers in the homilies that's the center of a religious service. Therefore, all the other things are, are extraneous to that. Um, and let me just uh, pop to this next picture here, um, where you see uh, a, a church that still has some stained glass windows, but there's certainly uh, no altar. Uh, there's nothing really on the walls. It's a rather plain interior. Um, and, and that is the sense that uh, Calvin was going for. Now, this is going to uh, contrast greatly with the Catholic churches, obviously, that uh, throughout the, the Middle Ages uh, had used stained glass to tell stories, biblical stories, uh, the crucifixes hanging from the walls uh, to remind one of Christ's uh, ultimate sacrifice uh, for humanity, uh, painting in side chapels, etc., uh, or even behind the altars, uh, again, to help um, a largely illiterate congregation of people um, understand the story and the message of, of God and the importance, uh, therefore. Um, so, um, one of the things I think that, that people struggle with, uh, with Calvin, is if, if, if God has elected people uh, for salvation before time, um, then why should people behave well? And Calvin argues that it really is, there's an obligation on the part of a faithful believer to behave well. And that would be a sign of what he called presumptive election, that if you behave well outwardly, uh, one can presume to be saved, though one doesn't really ever know. Um, so again, very difficult sort of uh, theology that Calvin preaches and, and writes about. Uh, one of the things we talked a little bit about was this idea of the appeal of Calvinism, and your textbook does uh, mention that in, uh, in a section. Um, I want to point out four different reasons, uh, and I had them listed up there on the screen, that made Calvinism attractive, uh, both in Geneva, in the Netherlands, in parts of Scotland, in France. And the first reason is really outrage at the corruption of the Catholic Church, uh, and Luther and Zwingli and other reformers had really done a good job, uh, and thanks to the printing press, the ideas had circulated widely uh, amongst uh, the European literate community that the Catholic Church had sort of fallen from its mission. Uh, and there was a great deal of outrage. The second, theological. Some uh, would argue that people liked the Calvinist idea. Um, and again, th uh, that may be hard for us today to understand, but uh, there was some uh, affinity to the theolo theological ideas that Calvin was expressing. Um, number three, sociological. Uh, and that really uh, uh, gets to the idea of certain social groups in society adopting Calvinism uh, for various reasons. Uh, one thing we want to point out, as Calvinism spread uh, into the Netherlands and into France, it was more a town and a city phenomenon. That is, it didn't really penetrate beyond uh, the towns into the countryside, uh, into the peasant villages. Um, so several groups, uh, merchants, bankers, lawyers, and artisans um, are, are really going to be more likely uh, to encounter the ideas of Calvin in the cities as Calvin begins to send preachers from Geneva into France and up to the Netherlands and up to Scotland. Uh, and, and these groups, uh, especially the merchants and the bankers, the lawyers, uh, really did not want to have to go through the priest 
in the Catholic Church uh, to to pray and to lead a faithful life. So uh, this group of people adopts Calvinism because it does away sort of with the idea uh, of the sacramental structure and uh, uh, the priest uh, special role. Now again, Calvin doesn't do away with the priesthood altogether. The pastor is a an important figure in, in Calvin's church and in his theology. But nonetheless, there is less of a presence and more of a direct participation participation in uh, the faith. So that's a sociological reason that some uh, embrace Calvinism. And in fact, upwards of 40% of the French nobility ad adopt Calvinism. And that leads me to the last point, and that is cynical self-interest. Uh, the idea that uh, the nobility that had been losing ground to the, the French monarchy that was trying to consolidate its, its power um, and overturning some of the uh, privileges and the things that nobles used to do, uh, this was a way for the nobility to sort of strike back at the king and the monarchy uh, by adopting this different uh, truth claim and then pursuing it um, to its fullest. So with that said, um, we're going to jump ahead. Uh, if you look at this, uh, you see that uh, Calvin is able to send, uh, as I say, 100 Calvinist uh, ministers or being sent uh, to France by 1562, um, and in the 1560s there are going to be upwards of 2,000 uh, different uh, uh, Calvinist churches and communities in existence and operating in France. And that really goes to uh, a point that I want to make about the idea of these new monarchs that we talked about in a previous chapter, and, and I think we tend to assume too much or place too much emphasis on the idea that this these new monarchs were all powerful and absolute in their uh, um, in their territories um, they weren't um, certainly they aspire to be all powerful and that's something that they will eventually arrive at uh, in the 17th century but really here in the 16th century uh, the idea that the nobility and 40 percent of the nobility could abandon the Catholic faith and and support a competing faith uh, really shows the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities that still existed in uh, kingship at the time and and particularly true in France so I'm going to offer a, an alternative uh, that, that may be useful as we look at these wars of religion in France and that is, it's not an absolute monarch, monarchy, but a composite monarchy. Um, so unlike the medieval monarchy, when you had this pyramid of power uh, uh, going from the masses uh, all the way up to the position of the king, where at each level, though, a, a local lord or noble was very much a king in his own territories, think of the Holy Roman Empire, um, that is very much more like that, um, this idea of composite monarchy has the king uh, is a central authority, a recognized central authority, uh, and he has ministers, he controls an army, uh, he levies taxes and collects those taxes, but there's still the residual noble, uh, these noble groups uh, and towns that are going to claim power and authority in ways uh, that are, are rather interesting. And I think that's what happens here in France. Uh, as we have a series of weak kings um, after 1559, um, the nobles are able to insert themselves back into the uh, uh, sovereignty question that we talked about uh, in interesting ways. So uh, we're going to start uh, our story then uh, in 1559. And 1559, why that year? Well, that is the year that uh, King Henry II dies in a jousting accident, uh, being held uh, part, as part of a ceremony to celebrate a wedding between his daughter and the, the son of Charles V, the emperor that uh, retired. Um, he dies in 1559. He had been a fairly effective king. Uh, and when he dies, his son, Francis, uh, Francis II, becomes king. He was a 15-year-old who is going to take control of the French monarchy. Um, and he dies within a year and a half of becoming king. And that leaves another uh, uh, brother uh, or son of King Henry II, that is Charles IX. Now, Charles is a nine-year-old. So he's not able to rule France uh, uh, in his own right. 
And he then has to have what's called a regent. A regent is somebody who stepped in to rule instead in the place of the king uh, as the king grew and matured. So uh, this is going to be the opening then for the Calvinist expansion into uh, France. So um, we see that uh, as, as we get to 1560, 61, uh, the Calvinists are feeling rather uh, bold and in a position of strength. And uh, in the towns that the Calvinists began to control, crowds would invade Catholic churches, and there was a lot of destruction of the Catholic churches. Statues, stained glass, uh, masses were interrupted, and Calvin argued that religious images shouldn't be removed shouldn't be removed uh, in acts of random violence, but that they should be removed in an orderly fashion by a peaceful process led by pastors. Yet crowds of enthusiastic Calvinists uh, really didn't heed Calvin's message, and they went on these rampages of, of destructive violence. This is going to lead to a breakdown uh, uh, in uh, the peace and the order and the harmony of the French kingdom, as the Catholics obviously respond negatively to attacks on their churches, the Calvinists feel emboldened by the fact that they're gaining more and more support uh, and more supporters and converts. Um, and in fact, that, that's something I already mentioned, the conversion of so many nobles uh, is now going to introduce a military element into the Calvinist churches. And remember that the nobility typically uh, provided uh, uh, fighting services to the French kings in return for all these special exemptions that nobles couldn't work, couldn't pay taxes, etc. Well, these nobles are now going to embrace the cause of Calvinism, which then militarizes uh, the Calvinist churches in towns. And that sets the stage then for these uh, wars of religion, because now we're going to have two sides, a Catholic side and a Calvinist side, both heavily armed and both willing to fight to defend their truth claim. And you can see here pictured uh, the destruction of these uh, churches. And, and I think it has to be remembered that the Catholic Church for centuries had been the center of social and political life. Uh, and so what, when the Calvinists begin to attack these churches, they're really attacking French society in addition to the Catholic Church, and I think that's an important point. So they're attacking both the Church, the Catholic Church, but also French society and traditions uh, in ways that had never been done. Now, uh, the Catholics respond to these attacks on their churches by forming a league, and it's called the Catholic Triumvirate. And the triumvirate was led by three very large and very powerful families. The most powerful uh, uh, of those families was the Guise family. And they exist to defend the faith. Uh, and their goal is to restore unity and purity in France. That is, Catholic unity, Catholic purity, and to eliminate the Huguenots. Um, so, uh, as I already mentioned, we have a 9, 10-year-old King Louis IX. Uh, who is not able to rule. So his mother, Catherine de' Medici, the wife of the dead king, Henry II, is going to play that role as regent. And Catherine, to her credit, maybe because she's Italian, kind of adopts a Machiavellian approach. She realizes that in order to maintain the state, that is the kingdom of France, she's got to work out a, a, a some kind of peace between these competing factions Catholics and Calvinists, and so she issues an edict in 1562 in January called the January Edict. Not a terribly uh, original title. Sometimes it's also known as the Saint-Germain Edict, and in which she gives a conciliatory gesture to the Protestant side, saying that, hey, Protestants, you can worship, but let's take your worship outside the towns. You could also hold what are called synods. These are big meetings of, of Calvinists across France. Uh, and so that's a really interesting point because up to now, uh, really any kind of resistance to royal authority uh, really wasn't possible because of the actual geography and distribution of people in cities. They were widely spread across the countryside in villages. What's going to happen now with the, the Calvinist churches is it's going to create a unified group of people that can gather and meet and discuss their issues. 
Uh, and that's going to set up uh, what we call then the wars of religion. And with that, I'll stop. If there are any questions, please write them down. Thank you.